is that's always a 30 second process. Hello everyone, my name is Merle Massey. I'm the coordinator for undergraduate research here at the University of Saskatchewan. With us today is Jill McMillan and Jill is a writing specialist, graduate writing specialist actually at the University of Saskatchewan, but um, a, a, a plethora of excellent uh, skills. And today she's giving us a workshop for the student undergraduate research experience on writing effective abstracts. Over to you, Jill. Hi everyone, thanks for inviting me to speak on this topic this afternoon. Um, I have layered in a few opportunities for there to be some participation, um, but if you have questions during the session, do feel free to surface them in the chat. I will keep an eye on the conversation that is happening there, and I'm also happy to stick around after the workshop if you have questions about this topic or maybe some other writing questions that you might have. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jill, um, and if you ever want to get in touch, uh, even though I do work primarily with graduate students, I am a resource available to all of the USAS community. Um, so you could always send me an email, jill.mcmillan at usas.ca. Always uh, very happy to hear from students um, and direct you to resources that might be of use or answer your questions. Uh, though if you are looking for one-to-one -one feedback on your work, I would recommend that you get in touch with the amazing resource that is the Writing Help Center. This is a free re resource for all USAS students, and you can receive one-to-one uh, -one feedback on your work either uh, via email or through uh, WebEx conversations. And if you're looking for a writing community, um, I do host weekly virtual write-ins. These happen every Monday and Tuesday morning from 10 to 11.30 a.m., Wednesday evening from 7 to 8.30 p.m., and on the last Saturday of the month, 10 to 11.30 a.m. And if you are looking for a, a way to remain productive and motivated during next week's reading week, you are also more than welcome to attend the virtual graduate writing retreat. This is targeted to graduate students, but upper year undergraduate students are more than welcome to attend. So if you're interested in, uh, again, connecting with a bunch of folks who are working on their projects, feel free to join and attend some of the sessions um, next week. And I'm going to jump in just for a second because to let any of our new students know that, that gr any of the resources that you access through the University of Saskatchewan Library, so any of their existing or upcoming webinars around writing or research or citation, uh, or any of these write-ins or the graduate writing retreat, they actually all qualify towards your SURE credit hours. Just jumping in, thanks, sorry, Jill. Oh, that's great to know. The, the, mo the more you know, fantastic. Um, so our first question today, what is an abstract? I'm not going to keep you in suspense. This is what an abstract is. An abstract is a piece of text that provides the overview of a longer paper. Um, it's a sort of bird's eye view of a, a larger piece of text. But what's really crucial is that it exists as a standalone piece of writing. So even if it is paired with this longer paper, which is quite conventional in a lot of the published academic texts that you see, it still has to exist by itself. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is later on. Uh, in terms of the characteristics, it's a very short piece of writing. It's very concise. Um, and on average, give or take, it's usually between 150 to 250 words. So not a lot of flexibility in terms of capturing and summarizing that longer text. Um, that word count, it is a bit of be very dependent on context. And so you're going to hear me on several occasions today talk about double check the word count requirements. Um, because I think there's nothing worse than writing uh, a piece of text and then realizing you have to cut 50 words from it uh, when you've already tried to create something that's very, very concise. Generally speaking, this is a piece of text that is going to be written at the very end of your project um, because it has to capture everything that has been done. Um, and so it's going to be easiest to reflect that once the, the project has um, is over and you can reflect on, okay, 
what does a reader need to know about my project? Um, and what can I tell them about my project in this little piece of text um, that they're going to read first? So it's, it's an interesting piece of text because we read it first, but we write it last. And it's really forming, in some ways, the first impression of the, the longer text. Okay, so that is what it is. But why do we actually write abstracts? This is where I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute or two in the chat. Why do you think we write abstracts? Um, what, what purpose do they serve? Why don't we just go and read that longer piece of text? So let's take a minute or two and contribute in the chat. Okay, so there are lots of great contributions coming up in the chat. If you're still typing, do feel free to finish typing your thoughts. Um, and your all of these comments are excellent. We're really circling around this notion of how a reader engages with an abstract. Um, in your own reading of journal articles and in doing research, I'm sure that you've probably made a lot of use of abstracts to determine, hmm, should I bother reading the rest of this article? Is this what I thought it was going to be based on the title? So as a lot of you noted, it really is relating to that reading process and that research process in terms of, does this relate to my work, to my area of research? Um, because prior to reading the abstract, we just have the title to look at. So it is a time-saving um, a piece of, uh, it, it's a time-saving convention in a sense, so that a reader is able to gauge pretty quickly whether or not that longer text is going to be of interest to them. So uh, it's, it has a very functional quality to it. It is, when we're thinking of a published uh, text with a, the formal abstract, um, it's part of how we actually locate when we're doing keyword searches. So abstracts are used by, um, um, by uh, journals and by uh, search. Um, um, we, we make use of those through online searches in order to help us locate information in a significant way. So the abstract is going to be very useful in terms of formal indexing as well as keyword searching. And in that sense, it's going to help us to locate uh, that longer text. But it can also exist in a, in a different way as well. Um, at this point in your academic career, you might not be publishing in an academic journal or submitting to an academic press. That might be in the future um, for you. But uh, our interest in abstracts, it certainly isn't limited to that published uh, abstract that would go along with um, a published journal article because abstracts are actually written for multiple contexts. They can be useful when applying for scholarships or grants, for instance. You might um, receive uh, guidelines that require you to write an overview, a summary of your work. Um, if you are applying to present at a conference, sometimes there will be what's referred to as a call for abstracts. And again, this is going to uh, allow someone to assess the, the project that you're proposing. Um, and as you move up um, through your program for longer papers, and then certainly for a thesis or dissertation, you're going to be required uh, to write an abstract. So we write them for uh, a couple of different reasons. Mainly though, it really is, the purpose of the abstract is to connect with a reader, with an audience. Um, the question that we ask ourselves when we are looking at an abstract, do I actually want to read the longer paper that is attached to this abstract? Is it um, intriguing me? Is it related to what I need? Is it related to my area of research and investigation? Um, and then, if we're looking at those abstracts that relate more to the conferences or uh, scholarship proposals, this question of, well, do, am I forming a favorable impression of this project? Uh, do I want to invite this person to present at the conference? Um, do I want to fund this project? 
So we're really very invested in how our audience is engaging with our abstract in the way that we're, of course, always aware of our um, uh, of our audience. But that abstract is almost a bit of a trailer for a longer work. In the same way that we see trailers for movies, that abstract is really trying to connect with the audience um, to get them to have a, a sort of buy-in with the, the proposed project. So who actually reads abstracts? Well, again, it's going to be very, very dependent on context. So professors, thesis supervisors, certainly um, at a course level, um, if you're applying for a conference and conference reviewers, so these could be org uh, organizers, volunteers. So depending on the nature of the conference, you could have student volunteers who are evaluating some of these proposals coming in. Uh, could be a scholarship reviewer, could be journal readers. Um, so if you are applying for uh, publication in a, in a journal, so this is going to be other academics in your field, professionals in the field. Um, but certainly if you're interested in submitting work to the University of Saskatchewan undergrad research journal, um, you would want to be mindful of what that abstract is communicating. Another reason why we might uh, want to um, gain confidence around uh, writing abstracts is because it is a transferable skill. Uh, I find transferable skills are something that we need to highlight often in academia so that we can start thinking about um, how all these things that we're doing can actually work in different contexts and certainly writing abstracts is one of these skills. Um, first, it helps to develop genre awareness. So anytime we are approaching a new text type, for instance, um, you uh, gain confidence around writing new types of text, new genres. Um, it is really enhancing your understanding of audience and context. So this uh, is known as the rhetorical situation of audience purpose and context. And it is also a very, very good opportunity to practice writing clearly and concisely. Um, writing that gets to the point uh, or the heart of the matter is often very valued in many different contexts. Um, and so you might find yourself wanting to really hone the skill set. So, for instance, if you end up in um, um, uh, a governmental or a business role in the future, an executive summary, has a lot in common with an abstract. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about structure. Um, because I think when we're looking at a text that is so focused and tar targeted, structure becomes very key because we don't have a lot of scope to play with in an abstract. So I, I share this uh, and th this sort of joke. Um, it's called abstract Mad Libs. And if we were meeting in person, I'd probably actually have everyone fill this out. And so what we're taking is uh, the, the idea of uh, a very generic uh, piece of scientific writing uh, around uh, writing of an abstract. Um, and it's a joke, yes, but it actually has some merit. Um, so it's, it's certainly exaggerating how conventional abstracts are, but in truth, abstracts actually often follow a fairly conventional structure. So we are going to look at two examples in quite a bit of detail toward the end of today's session that show how even within abstracts, there's a little bit of variation that's possible. Um, and that variation is going to be informed by uh, context um, as well as the, the, the individual writers crafting the, the abstract in question. So we're going to look at uh, a couple of possible structures for abstracts. But again, one of the things that I want to reinforce is that 
you always want to be very, very mindful of what the expectations are whenever you are approaching something that is um, part of a deliverable. So you want to review assignment expectations if this is something that you're preparing for course for a course rather. Um, you want to review citation style guides. So APA, for instance, um, that is a very popular citation style. And they have some clear guidelines around what an abstract should and should not contain. Um, or if you're submitting to a journal like the, the undergraduate research journal, or if you're submitting to, the confer uh, to a conference, what are the requirements around the abstract? Um, because certainly word count might be quite different in one context compared to another. And that's one of the things that we always have to be very mindful of with an abstract is the word count because it is such a short piece of writing. Um, depending on the context as well, sometimes you're going to encounter slightly different structures when it comes to an abstract. So it might be structured a little bit differently if it is reporting on a research study versus a literature review, for instance. Or you might have, uh, you might encounter in some disciplines that there are no headings and that is quite conventional for many different disciplines, whereas other disciplines really favor very explicit headings. Um, and these are known as structured abstracts. Um, and we're going to look at this when we see uh, our, a third sample in terms of how we might structure an abstract. So yes, abstracts. Generally speaking, some uh, fairly generic conventions, but as in with all writing, variation depending on context um, of, of, of writing and reading. So here is one structure. We're going to look at three, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but it's meant to show you the different ways in which you might conceptualize your abstract. So I quite like uh, this structure because not only does it break it down in terms of the content that should be covered, but it also provides an indication of how uh, much uh, space that information should be provided. So here it's actually broken down to a sentence level. So if you're really, really stuck approaching the writing of an abstract, using any one of these structures is going to be a good stepping stone. So for this structure, sentence one, what we know. So what is the research context? What, what is known about the topic in question? Sentence two, what we don't know. If you're familiar with CARS moves, um, I think I've spoken about those in a previous workshop for sure. Um, but CARS moves refer to um, this idea of locating a research gap, and we're, you're going to probably see some parallels with some of these structures. So sentence two, what we don't know, the gap in the literature, what is what, what needs to be investigated. Sentence three, how you answer that question, so basically how you address that gap of knowledge. Sentence four, what you found. Sentence five, what you conclude from these findings. And lastly, sentence six, why those conclusions are important. So in addressing all of these, you're going to have a nice little solid abstract that is really going to get to the core of your, um, of your project. But this might not speak to you. It might not appeal to you. So let's consider some other structures. So with structure two, we're taking a lot of similar elements from that first structure, but we're presenting them as questions. And we're sort of simplifying it even further in terms of reducing the, this, um, the number of uh, elements to address. So first, what problem did you study and why is it important? So again, that's providing a bit of uh, contextual information for your reader. Again, we want to be mindful that the abstract has to stand on its own. Um, so very briefly, in one or two sentences, uh, a reader needs to understand the context in which you are uh, writing and investigating. Second, what methods did you use to study the problem? 
to providing uh, a quick overview of some of the key components of your research design, but not getting into necessarily all of the details uh, of that methodology. Three, what were your key findings? That's something that we're always interested in. Uh, and lastly, what did you conclude based on these findings and what are the broader implications? So really thinking about, hmm, how would I distill this project down um, and identify as the, the takeaways for my readers? Now, in the third structure that we're going to look at, this is structured um, as uh, what is referred to as a structured abstract, where you would have these very clear and distinct headers um, baked in to the structure. So there's less, uh, perhaps less guessing for the reader because they know immediately to uh, what each section refers. This tends to be uh, quite popular in health fields, um, but uh, again, it's going to be dependent on the context in which you're writing. So background, briefly describe the context and motivation for the work. Purpose, summarize the research question or propositions addressed. The scope or the method, provide a description of the research considered and the methods used in the review process. And lastly, conclusions, state the conclusions of the review. So here we have, um, not only is it a structured abstract, but structured in accordance with a very specific type of project looking at a literature review. So to quickly recap uh, our structure, again, there might be some differences, and this is going to be often reflective of disciplinary norms. As noted previously, structured abstracts uh, tend to be quite common in health fields. You always want to be mindful of those structure expectations before drafting your abstract, so review what, uh, what guidelines you may have been provided. Uh, again, especially those word counts. If you have not received explicit guidance, I would always recommend to develop your genre awareness by digging into your field, seeing, hey, what do abstracts look like in my field? That will give you uh, a better sense of how you might approach the writing of your own abstract. And what's very key as well, we want to make sure that those abstracts are reflecting the content of the longer text. So you don't want to introduce any information in that abstract that is not contained within that accompanying text or that you will speak on uh, as going to a conference, for instance. Okay, so we talked about structure. Now I turn another question over to you. What do you anticipate might be challenging about writing abstracts? What might be the most difficult thing or things that uh, might frustrate you the most? Um, so let's take a minute or two and contribute in the chat. To um, keep typing away uh, and, and just to, I just want to acknowledge again all those fantastic comments in the chat. Um, a quite a bit of commonality in terms of concerns about remaining in the word count, uh, being concise, um, honing in on what you need to incorporate, what is considered extraneous detail. Um, and, and there's a, a good uh, point raised as well in terms of if you're writing for a, a conference and you actually haven't finished the research. We're not going to explicitly address that, but that is a really good comment as well. Um, in, in that instance, I think you'd probably want to um, uh, really look into some hedging language to sort of cover uh, your, uh, to, to reflect the fact that some things are anticipated, but uh, have not yet been conclusively found. But a good point to raise, thank you. So I think two of the, the key challenges too much or too little detail included, as many of you noted. Um, so it can be very, very difficult to determine, okay, what is the need to know versus nice to know? Because when we are so close to the research that we've been doing, it all seems really important, doesn't it? I know I've been there. 
And so it can be very difficult to take that bird's eye view and gain that perspective of um, what is actually the essential information as opposed to the secondary information. Um, and there might also be perhaps a lack of coherence. It, there might, it might seem a little bit disjointed when reading because of having to uh, focus so, so tightly. So some of those, um, uh, some of the style that we might normally incorporate into our academic writing, making use of a lot of transitions, for instance, uh, we might not be able to rely on that in the same way. And so it can maybe uh, then appear as uh, sort of choppy writing. And I'm also just trying to catch up a little bit on the, the chat um, as well. So question, concerns around tone um, and also feeling so tied in to the work and having a difficult time sort of separating yourself from the text that you have written. Um, and those are really good points as well. So how, how can we actually overcome some of these challenges? Because it's not necessarily easy to write in a concise way. I know I tend to be quite wordy when I write and also when I speak, which uh, you might be reflecting on uh, during this uh, workshop. So we really do want to strike that balance between the that broader perspective versus the detail, because we do want readers to connect with what we are writing, and readers usually respond most to detail, to things that are concrete. So we want to strike that balance. So, so I think what's, uh, what we want to think about is how does this abstract act like uh, a sort of appetizer? So we are in, we want to gain their interest, but we don't want to overwhelm them. We want to remember that they don't need all of that detail because hopefully they're going to be so intrigued by that project overview, then they are either going to invite us to that conference or they are going to then read the longer text. So we want to make sure that yes, it's a first impression, but we want to convince ourselves that because we're making a good first impression, they're going to then engage with our work on a deeper level. So when it comes to approaching the crafting of it, uh, I would recommend starting with those essentials before layering in the detail. So really focusing in on key questions. Why did I do this research or conduct this study? What did I find? Why are these findings meaningful? Um, and you can also make use of those sort of skeletal structures that we looked at earlier to craft the initial draft. So we looked at three samples, but other structures exist. Find one you and for your discipline, and that can be a way to start really thinking uh, about how you can start creating the base or the foundation of the abstract. But if you are still struggling with uh, finding that sense of focus, I might recommend a couple of other strategies. The first, and this might be appealing to you or absolutely not appealing to you, but I think it's worth trying. Write the first draft from memory. Sometimes again, when we are so close to something, it, uh, we sort of lose sight of the forest because of the trees, if you're familiar with that expression. We're so focused on the detail that we can't see that bigger picture. But if we're relying on our memory, that is, we're, we're going to be relying more on those key takeaway points. So you could ask, okay, well, what are the highlights? Um, how would I describe the project to someone? You could even do that. You could do a, a quick voice recording uh, as you're explaining it to someone. They don't even necessarily have to be in the room. You can just pretend that you're explaining it to someone. Um, and then you can compare what you have produced, what you've written or what you've said to the paper and consider, okay, does this actually accurately capture the longer work that I've been working on? And then you can make adjustments. As with any piece of writing, you're going to make revisions. So that first draft, those first couple of drafts, uh, it's all about um, seeing what fits. 
Another thing, another strategy that might be of value, using a highlighter, physical or digital to mark up the paper to really focus in on those key points um, and think about, okay, well, these, these are really the key ideas in the paper. That is the information that I'll want to surface in the abstract. If you find that you are still going over that word count. Um, don't despair. <laughs> I mean, I think that is one of the biggest challenges of writing an abstract is eliminating that extraneous detail. Here are some tips in terms of uh, removing some of that detail because we might um, unintentionally be incorporating information that doesn't have um, merit being in the abstract. So if you have too much background or contextual information, you would want to consider, hmm, am I overwhelming my, my reader with all of this information? Because when someone's looking at an abstract, they're very interested in that particular study or project, not the work of other scholars. So that contextual information can often be quite brief um, as well. Very rarely would you ever incorporate citations or references into that abstract, unless your uh, project in question is very much inspired by a particular researcher, for instance, um, you're unlikely to have that sort of information in the abstract. That's going to be in your literature review. Um, so it's, again, really focusing more on the, uh, the ideas, the information, as opposed to researchers who have done work um, that's related to yours. Um, information about routine laboratory procedures, um, uh, that level of detail is not um, critical for your reader to know at this point, uh, and they, they want to focus more on what's unique or interesting about your methodology um, rather than some um, common procedures. Uh, information about statistical methods or software used. Uh, unless this is the focus of your study, this might be information that is better contained in the longer text. Um, undefined abbreviations or acronyms. Um, so it's best to avoid these altogether unless permitted by the journal. Uh, if you're submitting to a journal, sometimes a journal will provide a list of acceptable um, abbreviations or acronyms that don't require definition. But if you are, incorpor if you are incorporating abbreviations or, ac or acronyms, they should be defined, um, but if possible, uh, avoiding them altogether can be useful. Um, and then again, any information that's not actually addressed in that longer text does not belong in the abstract. Um, so you always want to keep cross-referencing to make sure that those texts uh, relate to each other in a meaningful way. In terms of creating coherence, we use similar strategies um, that we would for any piece of writing. And so I'm recommending some uh, strategies that might be familiar to you that you might have encountered previously. Number one, one of the most effective ways, I think, to get a good sense of our writing um, or to revise our own writing is to read the abstract aloud, to read the writing aloud. Does it make sense? Do the sentences logically flow from one to the next? Does it, does it just fit together in a way that uh, is reasonable? Also want to double check language use. Um, if possible, opt for active sentences over passive sentences, opt for plainer language over jargon. Um, you'll notice in quite uh, a range of published abstracts that you'll, you might encounter reference to personal pronouns so we or I, um, and, and that's in keeping with uh, a structure that's more active um, in an abstract. And seek out feedback from readers. In reading the abstract, especially if they, they don't have any uh, prior knowledge of your study, do they understand your project based on reading that abstract? Um, if they can ask you follow-up questions, and it's clear that those questions signal their understanding, then that is going to be an indication that you're on the right track. Um, 
if they have questions that signal that they don't have a clear understanding, then that is going to be an indication that we need to sit down and revise and rework that abstract to make it more obvious because it is this standalone piece of writing. So if uh, someone has too many questions, um, then that might be an indication, hmm, I haven't fully captured what I did in this piece of writing. I love this piece of advice. Um, so Dr. Karen McKee, she is, uh, or she, was a, a governmental scientist in the United States um, and a former professor, I believe. And she has a great piece of advice here. Avoid the novices cut and paste approach when crafting your abstract and instead write a unique standalone summary. Because I think that is a temptation. We already have a bunch of text written in all likelihood. The temptation is probably to just copy and paste that information and to create an abstract. In doing so, we're going to encounter more issues with coherence um, than we would if we actually sat down and rewrote something or created something from scratch. So we want to be mindful of how we're even approaching the writing of this text in the first place. Oh. And I just wanted to quickly highlight this because uh, there, there might be concerns about verb tense. Um, and unfortunately, because you are probably coming from a range of disciplines, I can't provide a definitive answer on verb tense, but it's something that you will need to be aware of when writing an abstract, because um, this is, you'll want to know what the conventions are in your field and for the context in which you're writing because there is some disciplinary variation or contextual variation in terms of how scholars present their findings. Um, so for example, in the social sciences, it can be quite common to use the present tense to describe the study in question, and then the past tense to describe previous research. Okay, fair enough. However, in the sciences, what you might encounter instead is that the past tense is used to describe both the current and previous studies, but the present tense to describe the significance of the current project. And so that's where it can get a little bit frustrating um, because depending on what you're studying, um, and you might receive feedback from someone in another field saying, oh, but your verb tense is all confused. So you do need to, um, uh, make sure that you yourself know what those, those conventions are in your field um, so that you are uh, using verb tense appropriately. Um, and if you are using, if you're, if you're told to follow a certain citation style guide, uh, then they might, that sort of document might have uh, instruction on how to use verb tense. So unfortunately, again, just not a lot of consistency um, around verb tense uh, when it comes to abstracts. So there you go. In some ways, you would think, well, it's all, all this work has been done with perhaps the exception of some of those uh, anticipatory uh, abstracts. So you think past tense would be the default, but not necessarily the case. All right, so we're going to look at two sample abstracts. Um, and if we were in person, you'd get to look at them side by side with the screen. It's, we're going to have to rely a bit on our working memory. Um, but I'd just like you to think, okay, which sample do you prefer and why? It's not going to be a right or wrong answer here. It really is just to surface again, some of that variation that can exist when we look at these texts. So, our first one reads as follows. This is published in the Journal of Academic Writing. Uh, Many studies have made claims for the positive effects of multimedia in education. However, there is a lack of systematic and comparable research, especially when it comes to video tutorials. This study evaluates the use and benefits of short screencast video tutorials produced with Camtasia and published on YouTube in preparing students for research-based writing assignments. The study employs a multi-method research design 
comprising an analysis of video tutorial viewership data from YouTube and a student questionnaire on the perceived benefits of these video tutorials. The data on how the tutorials are used, as well as the questionnaire responses, enable us to highlight which aspects of these tutorials positively affect the learning process. Findings indicate that the use of such tutorials is more dependent on the type of information included, example, theory, instructions, examples, than their length within the range of three to six minutes. Additionally, novice introductory level students appear to have received greater benefit from the tutorials than students with some previous academic writing experience. Okay, let's pause here so you can reflect. Do you find this? Uh, abstract to be effective? Are there things that you like about this abstract? Uh, I'll just I'll take a minute before we look at the next sample. And you don't have to comment at this point. You can just sort of make a mental note for yourself um, as to your um, reaction to this sample. Okay, so now we're going to move to our next sample from a slightly different field. Okay, so this was published in uh, Nature Machine Intelligence, and it reads as follows. To help researchers conduct a systematic review or meta-analysis as efficiently and transparently as possible, we designed a tool to accelerate the step of screening titles and abstracts. For many tasks, including but not limited to systematic reviews and meta-analyses, the scientific literature needs to be checked systematically. Scholars and practitioners currently screen thousands of studies by hand to determine which studies to include in their review or meta-analysis. This is error-prone and inefficient because of extremely imbalanced data. Only a fraction of the screened studies is relevant. The future of systematic reviewing will be an interaction with machine learning algorithms to deal with the enormous increase of available text. We therefore developed an open source machine learning aided pipeline applying active learning, ASR review. We demonstrated that by means of simulation studies that active learning can yield far more efficient reviewing than manual reviewing while providing high quality. Furthermore, we describe the options of the free and open source research software and present the results from user experience tests. We invite the community to contribute to more open source projects such as our own that provide measurable and reproducible improvements over current practice. So let's again take a minute and reflect on your uh, opinion with sample two. Preference for one or the other in the chat, feel free to do so. So who would prefer, who prefers sample one? Maybe we can do some of these emojis or something or hands up or something <laughs> to, uh, to signal preference for sample one. And what about sample two? Oh my goodness, <laughs> some very strong opinions about sample two in the chat. Um, so if you're still on the fence, we're going to look at both of these in a bit of detail. Um, so I, the purpose of this though is to really, for you, for you to really reflect on why you prefer one to another, because sometimes those reactions, especially to one that we might not like, that's going to then signal to us okay, I don't like this, and I think I don't like it for these reasons, so I'm going to be sure that I do this instead for my own writing. Um, and this is one of the good things about really focusing on developing our uh, awareness of how other people are presenting information, because that's going to then help inform the writing of our own work. Um, yes, I see a hand up. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. You as well? Um, so for example, like, should we, as, is this where we're going to talk about them? Is that okay? Oh, sorry. Uh, the audio is not of super high quality. Can you restate your question? Um, hold on one second.
Sorry, did you want to restate your question? I just couldn't hear it very well. There, how's that? Yes, that's better. Awesome. Um, so it, it's okay if we talk a little bit? Sure, I just have to be mindful of the time and we do have a couple, quite a few more slides to go through. Yeah, you bet, it's very, very quick. Um, okay. Just for sample two, what I found, like if even if we took out the form formatting and grammar and all <laughs> of that, um, it's the tone that it takes. So I am at, like, my program is very heavily into the sciences. So, like, this is a language that I understand. But even I'm, like, this person is sounding pretentious. And I just <laughs> don't think, I don't think they're intentionally doing it. But I think mm -hmm. they're throwing out words that they don't quite understand um, in an attempt to maybe impress somebody and you know, there, there are a lot of general claims but I don't see like specifically what are you working on like what is this thing that you're doing I get general explanations but that's it mm. yeah and I think it I think you're on to something I think the second one has perhaps more of a promotional tone attached to it and it's because they've designed a new tool um, and so there, there is that call for people to sort of start thinking about this new tool that's been designed um, in a way that we don't see that similar tone in the first sample. And so I think that might also account for some of these differences. Oh, totally. That makes total sense. But, you know, even with, uh, I mean, uh, even if you go back to, or you don't have to go back, but they're talking about basically technology. And, uh, you know, we publish these things in um, usurge, but honestly, anyone outside of this, are they even going to know what this person is talking about? Or I just feel like this is all over the place. I don't feel, uh, yeah, uh, promotional would be the word, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and again, you're bringing up another really good point, the importance of context, because often when we're encountering abstracts, we're encountering them in specific contexts. So we know what journal they've been published in, we're looking for this type of information in the first place. Um, and often scholars will still have that uh, sort of insider uh, sort of approach when they're communicating information. But that then risks their information not being accessed by people who are a little bit outside of their field. Um, and then that can be to their disadvantage, especially if you are developing that actually has the potential to be used by people across academia. Um, so there might be a, they might be doing a little bit of a disservice to themselves by not expressing this in a more plain and accessible way. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so we're going to quickly um, go through both of the uh, samples in a little bit of detail. Um, but again, it's great conversation happening. Um, and I think one of the things that we're going to see when we look at sample one and sample two is that there is perhaps a greater simplicity when we're looking at sample one in terms of uh, how it's been organized. Um, so. We begin with one sentence that does a lot. It's providing that immediate sense of context. So we know we're looking at multimedia and education, and we're also sig signaling that gap in the research, what isn't known. We, we, we don't have uh, knowledge uh, about how effective these video tutorials might be. So we're covering two uh, items within one sentence. Um, so a very effective use of limited space. And then we're immediately addressing how the current study, um, oh, I'm missing a word there, um, but how the current study addresses the gap by asking a specific question. Do video tutorials help students with specific types of writing assignments? Um, and this is what this study does. This study is interested in finding out um, if this sort of intervention actually has an effect. So trying to fill that gap of knowledge. Then it continues. 
really focusing on how the question was investigated. So we're looking at research design and also an explanation of the justification for this me methodology um, and how this data was used. And that then segues quite seamlessly into the findings, which ultimately I think we're always very interested in when we are looking at an abstract. Um, we want to know, okay, well, what did they find? What did they find? Does this relate to my research? Am I intrigued? Do I want to learn more? Do I want to invite them to my conference? Do I want to read the rest? Do I want to read the actual full paper? Now, when we look at sample two, uh, oh, and I just wanted to point out here, we also have very predictable sentence starts. Um, and sometimes this uh, degree of uh, repetition can get a little bit boring. But within the context of a very short piece of writing, when people have a certain expectation when they're looking at this piece of writing, having those very predictable sentence starts can actually create a nice clear direction for readers. Now, in contrast, sample two seems a little bit more segmented, shall we say. So we do start with a sense of the purpose of the study and what was done, um, but then we're, we're getting into the justification of the research, providing some of the rationale. What, uh, why was this project needed? What problem does it solve? But then it's the sort of continued justification, um, which seems perhaps um, that there might have been some flexibility here to be a bit more concise in terms of how this information was being presented. Um, so as a reader, we're really, it, it takes us quite a while to figure out um, what this tool is. There's reference to the tool at the very beginning, um, but then we don't encounter reference to that tool until about the halfway mark of that abstract. So it's starting to become a little bit repetitive as a result, which is something that quite a few of you noted in the chat. Um, so we do eventually find out what was discovered, but there's not actually that much discussion around that discovery. Um, instead, we then encounter some secondary details that may or may not be of interest to readers. And then we end with this call to action. And it's not that this is something that we shouldn't have in an abstract, um, but potentially having fewer rhetorical moves um, could uh, simplify and actually make the lead up to the call to action a bit more effective. When we look at the sentence starts, these are also quite a bit less predictable than our previous sample. And again, I think this has both pros and cons uh, in terms of um, keeping us guessing. Uh, certainly, we are, uh, we're not necessarily easily anticipating what is to follow as we're reading. Um, and this can keep us interested or it can frustrate us. So again, we make these decisions when we're putting our uh, abstracts together. So we are almost at time. I'm happy to continue. I did have a little spotlight that I um, want to surface if, uh, if there's interest in looking at that. Um, so Merle, I'm not sure if you want me to continue. I'm good to go. Absolutely. Um, I think it, since we're recording it, I think that we might as well continue if that's okay with you. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, but I understand if anyone has uh, other commitments that they have to attend. Um, but I just wanted to quickly spotlight graphical abstracts. So I'm not going to look at this in a lot of detail, but I did want to surface it simply because this is um, related to our topic at hand and also um, something that you may or may not have awareness of at this point in your academic career. But uh, some publications do allow for graphical abstracts in addition to written abstracts. Um, generally, what I've encountered so far is that it's generally in the sciences. So if anyone has examples outside of the sciences that they'd like to share, do let me know. Um, and basically it is a, an image that provides 
that snapshot of the text in question. So this has some benefits. Readers can quickly understand the purpose and key findings of the research project, and it can really help to further pique reader interest and encourage further reading of the longer text at hand. So this is an example of a graphical abstract. Um, it's, it, I think it does communicate how context is everything because the purpose of a graphical abstract is to really communicate an idea very clearly to the intended audience. I am obviously not the intended audience of a graphical abstract like this because the image doesn't mean anything to me. However, for your intended reader, if they did have some of this prior knowledge, this kind of image will likely speak in a very significant way to them. Um, in terms of craft, creating or crafting graphical abstracts, here are some recommendations. Number one, Again, this is speaking to submitting uh, to a journal, but if you have the scope to uh, submit for a conference, for instance, then similar steps uh, could be used. So follow any guidelines that have been provided. Summarize the main outcome of your research. So it's really focused on uh, really that takeaway finding. Uh, select an appropriate platform to create graphics. Add important design elements and keywords and keep the design crisp and simple with appealing colors. So again, we're always mindful of how a, a reader is going to interact with that. Um, in terms of some of those resources that might be of use, I've highlighted some here. Um, surprisingly, to me at least, um, PowerPoint is often used to create these graphical abstracts, um, but two other popular ones are BioRender and Mind the Graph. Um, but be mindful, some platforms will have costs attached or certain limitations around them. So it might be that they're free to use for educational purposes, but not publication. So you do want to be mindful of the usage policies. So let's uh, wrap up. In terms of next steps and takeaways, just keep in mind abstracts provide a snapshot of your work. Um, they should uh, they must rather accurately reflect the content of longer text. They are intended to help readers make very quick decisions about your work in terms of how they want to engage with it. Um, so we want to take the time and effort necessary to craft and revise your abstract. Don't want to rely on copy and paste. And of course, keep double checking those word limits. You can review examples from your field for additional insight in terms of how you might approach the writing of your abstract, and as with all writing, seek out feedback from readers so that you can really uh, create something that is the, the strongest that you can make it. So a couple of recommended resources, and just a reminder that your university library is here to help. So if you're looking for anything from basic math and stats help, insight into developing your study skills, research support, writing help, do check out your library. Um, we've kept a lot of those supports and services uh, throughout this year of remote learning, um, and we're always trying new things as well. So thank you so much for me this afternoon. I apologize for going a few minutes over, but thank you for the participation and all of the, um, the, the comments in the chat or uh, via audio. Um, it was, uh, it's always great to be invited to do these Workshop oh, and we, and we love to have you. We, you've, 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 been a, you've been a super um, supporter of the SHARE program, and we really love, love to have you. I'm going to stop the recording, but if anyone still has questions, Eve, I think, might have her hand up. We'll go from there. I think I had it on for, like, a long time. And